IQ. Dave? Go ahead, Dave. Okay, well, thanks. Um, I'll say uh, good evening to everybody. I am Dave A6YQ. I'm now living outside of Boston, uh, moved here for work back in 97. So I'm in exile, um, but there's, there's good DX here. So I'm gonna to talk to you tonight about DX Lab, which is some software I started writing uh, right after I got my novice ticket in 1990 um, and eventually decided to make it available to everybody. Um, I joined the club, I think, as soon as I got my DXCC. And much of what I learned about DXing, I learned at the feet of members of this club. So this is my way of saying thank you for helping me. And I hope I'm passing things along as you pass along things to me. So with that, I will share my screen. Um, and I want to do share computer sound. And I will put it in presentation mode. Let me do that. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Good, thank you. All right, so um, the motto of DX Lab is better DXing through software. It was my belief back in the 90s that as hardware and software got less and less expensive, it would be possible to put more energy into having computing help us be better DXers. We all know what DXing is. It's the art and science of making two-way contacts with distant radio stations. Um, and we all love to do that. Um, the X Lab helps us do that in two different ways. The first way, arguably, is by minimizing the amount of paperwork we have to do so we can spend more time on the radio. And the second time, the second way is by helping us be more productive. So let's start with the paperwork angle. Um, pretty much all awards require QSLs. So whether you do it with LOTW or paper, you got to do the work. So with Logbook of the World and EQSL, um, there's some good automation. Uh, DX Lab has a database of known authenticity guaranteed participants. These are people whose uh, confirmations count for CQ awards. You can automatically upload your QSOs to EQSL as you log them. And with one click, uh, DX Lab will update your log QSOs to reflect any new confirmations and any award progress you've been granted. For LOTW, about the same functionality is provided with one extra, and that's possible because the database of users that the ARRL provides includes the date of last submission. So that means we can do this thing here at the end, show QSOs that should be confirmed by logbook but aren't. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you know that you have a QSO with a station that submits QSOs to logbook of the world, and you had a QSO with that station in April, but it's not confirmed yet. But the database shows that that station has been uploading QSOs not just in April, in May, and in June, then that probably means that your QSO, his, he uploaded your QSO, but you didn't get a confirmation, which means that there's something wrong. One of you uploaded the wrong information to logbook, and as a result, it didn't match. So with one mouse click, you can get a report of all QSOs in your log that should be confirmed by logbook, but aren't, so that you can contact your QSO partner and then figure out what's wrong. Either you, you have to resubmit or they do, you gotta correct the mismatch. We can also automatically generate QSL cards or labels uh, for confirmations that are needed for DXCC, Marathon, uh, the awards you're pursuing. So what do I mean by needed? So needed means that a confirmation of the QSO would advance your award progress towards the awards you're pursuing on the bands and modes you're pursuing them. This one window in DX Lab captures all of the awards you're pursuing and where you're pursuing them. So you can see that for DXCC, I'm working on everything from six to 160. I'm interested in phone CW and digital. This is a little bit of a funny thing here. Back in the, uh, around 2001, Peter G3PLX developed a new mode, a new digital mode called PSK31. And I helped him with it. I thought it would be a great mode for DXers. So just for fun, I added a checkbox right here that used to say PSK31. And what it did, if you checked it, it meant even though there's no DXCC award for working every single country in PSK31, DX Lab would help you do that. So it was kind of a way to help PSK get going. Well, as the other modes came along, people would say, well, I don't want to work every country on PSK31, but I'd sure like to do it on Domino. 
or I'd sure like to do it on FT8. So now you can specify any digital mode and say over and above what you're trying to do for DXCC, you'd like to work all the DXCC entities in that mode as well. And I'm doing that with FT8 just for fun. I'm not pursuing marathon this year. I don't chase WIPEX, but I am pursuing VUCC on six meters and I'm pursuing WAS on 160 and six. I think I pretty much have it everywhere else, but it's fun. Like this is like, you know, a, the, a 110 spare in bowling, you know, the high band and the low band. So everything that, that, that needs to know whether or not some QSO should be confirmed is driven by this set of entries. So for example, I can say, well, print, print me some QSL cards for everything where I need confirmation. So I needed AP2TN, I needed JT5DX, A51A, VQ9LA, and I get this automatic printing of QSL cards. This is four up on index stock. It's the cheapest way to produce QSL cards because the paper costs about two cents a sheet and you get four cards out of it. Of course, you have to use a knife or a paper cutter to, uh, to separate them. But you can see that all the information is there uh, and uh, you can handle multiple QSOs for QSL card. Here's a little fancier card. It's a single card. It's got a background picture of Winger Shake Beach in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Nice lighthouse and some birds. Uh, but you can see that this is also correctly handling a bureau routing. So um, that's all completely automated. You can alternatively print labels. So here I'm using, I think, sort of standard set of uh, labels that people use. You have to separate the label and affix them to your, to your uh, QSL cards. You can also do that with address labels. So that's how you get QSL cards efficiently and inexpensively. But where do you send them? This is one of the earliest things I did, is I recognized that a lot of information about QSL routes was on the web, even back in the 1990s. Now, we all know about QRZ and, and Buckmaster and all that stuff. And the idea here is that you want to type a call sign in once you're looking for a QSL route. And by clicking each of these buttons, you basically do a web search on that call sign of that particular source of QSL information. So if I click the QRZ button, I'll see the QRZ page for VK3, VK3ZL. But it turns out that Australia has an online call book. So what this application, which is called Pathfinder, it's the, that component of the suite does is if you type in a call sign where it knows about an online call book for that particular country, it will manifest a button here. It's a BKCB button. And when you click it, you get the uh, Australian online call book showing you that VK3ZL you know, lives right here at this address. So all told, there are about 80 of those. So this application makes it really easy to quickly find QSL information. And by checking multiple sources, you can increase your confidence that you got the right address. Okay. You can also generate address labels. We can print envelopes. We can use full page printers or individual label printers. And we can also keep track of, QSO, Q, of QSLs that you've requested but haven't yet received. So one click produces this report. And you can see that I've got three um, QSOs where I sent out confirmations a long time ago. I mean, this one's 2001, but hey, these are all on six meters. Uh, so I'm not giving up hope. Um, but this is telling me how long that request for a confirmation has been outstanding and why I need it. So these two I need for VUCC, this one I need for DXCC as well as VUCC. Okay. So after we get confirmations, eventually we like to be able to submit those confirmations for award credit. And DX Lab automates that process as well. So you can generate award progress reports, lots of them. Here's the list. Um, so you can see all the, 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 the ones you know and love and uh, the next step. And then there's a lot of secondary awards that you can pursue. And when you do that, you get a nice progress report. Here's the beginning of my DXCC progress report. So you can see, you know, it shows all the usual stuff, countries worked. Um, Phil likes to get this stuff for the, for the ladder. Um, and then, you know, each, each entity and where, where you've, worked it and where you've confirmed it and where you have award credit for it. So very easy to get um, progress reports for all the awards I just showed you. Um, what we really wanna do is now submit confirm QSOs for award credit. And because a lot of these award sponsors charge by the QSL, you'd like to submit the minimum number of confirmations you can to get the most possible award credit for doing that. 
That's called optimal submission. Logbook of the world notably doesn't do that. If you haven't worked P5 on CW and you haven't worked P5 on, on 40 meters, but you have one QSO with P5 on 40 meters CW, logbook might not submit it. It might submit some other CW QSO and some other RIDI QSO. Uh, whereas DX Lab will always say, oh, this QSL gets two of the things I need, both a band and a mode, and optimally submits that. And it does that for DXCC, IOTA, uh, VUCC, WAS, WAS, and WIPIX. Um, so here's a record sheet that DX Lab created for me, I guess back in 2020, where it automatically noticed that these were the three confirmed QSOs I had uh, that I had not yet received DXCC award credit for, and it generates all the required paperwork for DXCC, so in, including the uh, online DXCC ADIF file. So really, the, it really minimizes the amount of paperwork you have to do. And I have to jump up and down about working HL on 30 meters. That was a real struggle for me from here on the East Coast, as was Indonesia. And finally, th th these were the examples I used in my presentations for many years because I was plotting to figure out how to work it. Uh, finally, um, when you are granted award credit, you can update your log to reflect that credit granted. And that's possible with DXCC and IOTA. It's not possible with the other awards because the award sponsors don't provide the programmatic interface to do it. I'm hoping that more will do what DXCC and IOTA are already doing. Okay, so that was a breathless rush through automating the paperwork so we can spend more time DXing. So let's get to the heart of the issue, which is how does DX Lab help you find and work the DX Lab you need? Well, to explain that to you, I have to tell you a little bit about what DX Lab is. Uh, why it is, how it's architected, and some of its particular capabilities. So let's start with what's driving this. So the technical term for this is user-driven iterative development. What that means is that I have a group of 4,700 um, participants, aficionados, people who really like helping move DX Lab forward, to whom I am constantly developing new releases. And each release is referred to as an iteration. So in any given month, I might release, I don't know, three or four different versions of different DX Lab applications. You'll see there's eight of them all together. My highest priority is correcting defects. So most of the time, the number of reported but uncorrected defects across the entire DX Lab suite is one or two. Today, it happens to be two, although I did send a version out to five and five of the users uh, who complained about a particular complaint. They reported a defect and I fixed it for them. So the defect is fixed, it's just not publicly released yet. All the enhancement lists are public. So everybody can see what's on the list. And as I said, I try and make multiple releases per month. I'm trying to do the impossible, which is to make software that's both powerful and easy to use. Now, when it comes down to it, this is a trade-off, you can't do both. Um, you know, something that's trivially easy to use would not be very powerful and vice versa. I tend to come down on the side of power and try and provide as much documentation as I can so that people who don't instantly get it can at least figure out how to use it or ask questions on the reflector. The XLab is primarily for DXers, no question about it. It's not a contesting application, but lots of operators use it uh, for casual operating. And a lot of contesters will upload their contest logs from N1MM or whatever they're using to the XLab and use the XLab as sort of their uh, uh, system of record um, and their ability to upload things to logbook or generate QSO cards. It runs on Windows, primarily 7, 8, and 10, but you can still run it on these older versions of Windows if you really want to. You can run it on Mac in a virtual machine. You can run it on Linux in a virtual machine. I don't think many people do that, but it does work. Now let's talk about the architecture. So DX Lab is eight applications that run individually, but they automatically detect each other's presence, with, no matter what order you start them in. And when they detect each other's presence, they start interoperating without you having to say anything. You can start them in any order, however you want. They'll find each other and they'll work together. Here they are. Oh, here's seven of them. So there's one that does transceiver control, controls your rig. There's one that does location control, controls your rotator, and also knows a lot about where things are. There's a logging component. There's a propagation prediction component. There's a component that gathers lots of DX spots and mines data from them. We'll spend a lot of time on this. And there's a component that you already saw, Pathfinder, that does QSL routes. 
And so here's all the names of these applications. I won't go through them. I would just point out that when Warbler is the application that does digital modes. So it, and it counts CW as a digital mode as well as RIDI and PSK. So all these interfaces are open and public. And this is a very modular and loosely coupled architecture. What do I mean by that? Well, for one, you can start with any one of these. It doesn't matter. And they'll automatically figure out the right thing to do. The other is they're disconnected from each other. So I can be fixing a bug in one Warbler while I'm adding a new feature to DX Keeper while I'm testing the last new release of Spot Collector. So this modularity and the loose coupling among these applications means that I can work on many in parallel. And I have a pipeline where I've got two or three things in the oven all the time. So that makes it easier to continuously offer new releases. And also means if you find a defect, I can quickly fix it because I'm not I'm not stuck behind 50 features I'm trying to jam into a single release. So the result is, is quite effective. The other thing is, as I said, this set of interfaces is published and opened. So over the last 20 years, a whole group of additional applications have used those interfaces to interoperate with the XLab. Some are you know pretty well, like CW Skimmer, CW Get and MRP40 will decode CW and display it in Warbler's window. WSG, JTX, of course, you know, JT Alert, FL Digital, Digi, and Mix W, um, and Multi PSK for digital modes, MFSTV for slow scan TV, works with the Win, win for Suite. And, you know, if you really want to, you can set things up so that when you log a QSO in N1MM, it ends up in your DX Keeper log immediately. And lots of guys do that. There's also some other integration. Win Warbler includes both the MMTTY and two tone engines. So when you're working ready, it can display a decoded signal twice, once decoded by MMTTY, once decoded by two-tone. You can actually get a third one from Gritty or from your K3. So that gives you basically um, multiple decodings of the same signal, which is quite helpful when the signal is weak. Commander can interact with SAT PC32. So if you want to do satellite tracking, Log Publisher will upload log QSOs to QRZ to uh, a couple other places online. Prop view basically is a graphical front end to VOA cap. We'll talk about that. VOA cap is a government created propagation prediction engine. DX view has its own built in world map, but it also interoperates with DX Atlas and with Google Maps. And um, Spot Collector interacts with uh, Spot Spy, which gives you some additional capabilities as well. So there's about 30 different developers besides me who are complementing DX Lab by building applications that interoperate with it. So this is a real ecosystem. And I go out of my way to not replicate stuff that these guys have done by doing it here. So for example, I could, I could add QRZ upload to Log Publisher, excuse me, to DX Keeper, but why? DX Log Publisher does it, so that's good. So when you look at it on screen, these are the main windows of each of those applications. You know, here's DX Keeper, the logging application, here's DX View, here's Commander, the rig control application, and it's band spread, here's Win Warbler, decoding some ready, and here's Spot Collector, which we'll talk about in a bit. So the one thing you might say is difficult about this architecture, where it's seven different applications, each with its own main window, and they all have subsidiary windows, is how do I manage this array of applications? Isn't that a real pain? Well, it was at the very beginning, but I solved that problem by creating an eighth application called the DX Lab Launcher. So what the launcher does is makes this suite of seven applications behave as if it were a single application. So you can say, okay, I'm using five of the seven. I'll define that as my configuration. When I click the start button in the launcher, it launches those five. If I click the minimize button, it minimizes all the windows associated with those five. I can restore those windows. I can terminate all of the applications I'm using with a single uh, mouse click here. Also, whenever a new release gets available, a uh, message appears here saying, hey, there's new upgrades. And you click the configuration window, and you can upgrade to the latest version of whatever these apps you're using. So startup, shutdown, installation, upgrade, all just one click. So it makes the suite act like it's a single application when it's actually seven. So you get the best of both worlds. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, multiple views of ActiveDX. This is the fundamentally unique capability in DX Lab that I'm shocked, but still after 20 years, no one else to my knowledge has provided this capability. It's a little bit complicated, but I will go through it step by step and I think you'll understand it. 
So we all know what VX spots are. You know, they started out with um, packet cluster. Um, you know, that was K6LLK ran a packet cluster for the uh, uh, for your uh, for the club for the longest time. I was a very early user of that. Um, then that moved to the internet. So now we have Telnet clusters all over the world. So lots of spots coming in. Spots have enormous amounts of data in them, but that data looks like a big cluttered mess most of the time. So I set out to change that. So my notion is to create what's called an active DX database, where there's one entry in this database for every currently active DX station. So here we have P5DX on 14005, QSX 14007, he's in CW. He was first spotted at 0117. He was most recently spotted at 341 Zulu. He was spotted from Europe, from the West Coast of North America, of course, and from Oceania. Now, how is this database populated? It connects to up to seven different sources of spot information, up to four Telnet clusters, to the reverse beacon network, to the DX Summit web cluster, and it can use instances of WSJTX that you're running as a spot source. So anything your instance of WSJTX decodes gets put into this database. And so for each entry has data harvested from many, many different spots. Now, sometimes it might just be one spot, but whenever the first and last times are different, you know that there was at least more than one spot. So here's KP1RY up on 15 meter RIDI, and he's been spotted all over the place. So this gives you a sort of a primitive view of propagation because you can see where these stations are being reported from. So that's the active DX database. It tells us what DX stations are currently QRV. The propagation prediction engine, which is VOA cap, helps us understand which of these currently active DX databases can I likely copy. In DX Lab, you can configure it so that automatically you get a propagation prediction for every active DX station. And I'll show you what that looks like. Over here is your log. Your log contains every QSO that you've logged, but it also contains some other tables for each of the awards you're pursuing. So for DXCC, it knows every DXCC entity that you have worked on which bands you've worked it, on which modes you've worked it, and whether it's worked, confirmed, or award credit granted. By having a separate table here, when, when some new active station appears, we can instantly know whether it's needed. We don't have to go pawing through the log QSOs to say, yeah, we ever work P5DX on 10 meters? Uh, we know right away because it's one probe into this table answers the question. So this database tells us what QSOs and QSLs are needed for the awards we're pursuing on the bands and modes specified. Going back to that screenshot I showed you early on. We also have the logbook and EQSL databases. We already talked about that. They answer the question, which of these active DX stations QSL via logbook and which QSL via EQSL? So now with those databases, the active DX database, this prediction engine, the logbook and EQSL databases, and all this information about what we've worked and where our awards are, we can now begin generating what are called views. In terms of database, databases, a view is information from databases, but formatted in a way to be particularly useful for a given purpose. So our first view down here is a tabular view. So let's look and see what that's like. So this is one entry for each currently active DX station. So here's TA7I, um, that's Turkey, 20 meter CW, first spotted at 1919, last spotted at 1919. So this guy's only been spotted once. We know his CQ zone, we know his grid square. Um, and because I've configured it appropriately, we know that the signal to noise ratio, the forecast signal to noise ratio is 29, which for his mode, which is CW, means there's an 82% chance that we could copy this guy on the short path. On the long path, the SNR is much lower, and so the probability is lower. Here's um, another column I want to point out. This is quite unique, ODX, origin DX. This is the distance between the station, the closest station that spotted TA7I and my QTH. 
Now, in this case, only one station spotted this guy. So that's the distance to that station. And the same here is true with, let's look at HB20 MDC, you know, first time spotted 1915, second time 1919. So he's been spotted more than once. And we can see that he's been spotted from South America and from the Midwest of North America. So we can go through these and see for each of these stations, when they were first spotted, what their frequency is. Here's a station AQ7VB is operating split. So not only do we know his frequency, we know the last reported split frequency. And by the way, if you have commander running and you double click this entry, it will set your radio not just to 10107, but it'll put your radio in split and set VFOB to the correct offset. Notice that it's figured out the IOTA grid square, uh, the, excuse me, the IOTA tag for AQ7VB. So all this information, the DX grid square, the ODX, the distance between um, my QTH and the closest spotted station, was all extracted from the incoming spots. Now this entry is in red because it's needed. That, and I, this is, I put this in there, three Y's not QRV right now. So stay where you are. You don't have to run your rigs. Um, but I, I inserted this to create an example where I haven't yet worked um, three YB on RIDI. So this is needed. And the need column has a D in it, uh, prompting me to know that I'm that's needed for DXCC. It knows the, uh, the, the IOTA tag, uh, it knows the grid square, and the distance is one because I'm the one who spotted this. So the distance is obviously very small. But we can see that you know this guy, HB220 MDC, was spotted by you know at least one of these spotters was only 515 miles from my QTH. And here for KC1YL, you know, one of the spotters was th only 319 miles from my QTH. So um, looking at this we see that this is filtered, meaning we're only seeing a subset of the information in the database. It's filtered by band, by mode, and by origin. So let's look at the band filter first, and that's the band filter window. So what this is telling me is, don't hide, don't show me any active stations on 630. I'm not chasing 630. The same for 60 meters. I don't care about 60 meters. I don't care about eight meters. And I don't care about anything above six. So the first thing it's doing is eliminating active stations in the tabular display that I don't care to work. For 80 and 160, we all know that there's no making DX contacts during broad daylight. So what this means is don't start showing me uh, active stations on 160 until 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes after my sunset. I'm sorry, that's 30 minutes before my sunset. And stop showing me uh, 160 meter QSOs 45 minutes after my sunrise. And down here we see that DX Lab automatically computes the current sunrise and sunset at my QTH. It knows where I am. So it just does the astronomy calculations so that these get updated all the time. So you never have to come back and change these as the seasons change. You just figure out, you know, like 80 meters, uh, this is good for 60 minutes before my 60 minutes before my sunset, uh, excuse me, 60 minutes after my 60 minutes before my sunset and 90 minutes after my sunrise. So you just set this once and the filtering happens. On six meters, I have a different strategy. I don't wanna know about six meter stations unless the closest station spotting that was at least within 500 miles of my QTH. So the fact that you guys are working Japan on six meters, I don't wanna see those entries in my database. I can't do anything about it. No way that I'm, I'm gonna be able to make that. So until somebody within 500 miles of my QTH is, is, is spotting a six meter station, I don't wanna hear about it. And that, that's filtered. Here's the mode filter. Now there's a ton of modes. Everybody has their own choices. Um, I pursue sideband, CW and RIDI. Um, I also like FT8 and FT4. You know, some of these other modes for me are like watching paint dry. You may love them, but you can basically eliminate them from your screen by just unchecking the box here. Note that that doesn't mean that the data goes away. The data is still in the database. So if you go back and click Olivia, you'll suddenly see who's ever QRV on Olivia in your spot data, in your tabular view. So that's what we mean by filtering. Propagation forecasting. On 80 through 10, the VOA cap engine can predict the short path and long path, long path probability. That's easy for you to say. So that's these columns over here where you can see the single to noise ratio and the probability. So the station that I need, 3Y0RY, there's actually a 52% chance of me being able to work it um, if it was real. 
and not just my plug. But you can see that some of these are up a, a, around 100 and some of them, you know, not likely. I'm not gonna work 8Q7VB on 30 meter CW at this particular time. There's just not a path and the long path isn't gonna help either. So now what if I click the need filter here? Now I'm filtering what I'm seeing to only see active stations with whom a confirmed QSO would advance my award progress. Now, a bunch of these are red, which means they're unconfirmed. One of them is blue, which means it's worked, but not confirmed. The red ones all happen to be needed for DXCC. So this was back when I hadn't yet worked HL on 30 meters. And uh, this guy in Pennsylvania, which is my home state, um, I don't yet have confirmed on WAS for six meters. So that means WAS. So now what we're seeing is just the six stations that are currently active that I need and their prop propagation probabilities. If I say, um, show me the needed DX on selected bands and modes that have been spotted from the east coast of North America, the only one I see is the KC3 on six meters. So going back to step here, you know, these guys were all spotted from Europe, this guy from South America, this guy from Asia, only this one station was spotted from, uh, from North America East Coast. But I can see that with one mouse, oops, wrong direction. I can see that with one mouse click and really home in on what's available. I could also say by clicking this need 50 button that I created, only show me needed DX that I have a better than 50% chance of being able to hear. And that zooms right in on 3Y0RY, where the probability of being able to work this is 52%. Whereas if we look at these other ones, 2%, 1%, 2%, 3%. So again, I can quickly focus on something where I can practically spend my time, if only they were really too early. All right, so um, let's go one step further. I mentioned to you that if you're running WSJTX and you like using modes like FT8 and FT4, your WSJTX instance can serve as a spot source. So anything that you decode using WSJTX is gonna create entries in this Data, active DX database that you can look at. And not only does it create entries, but it shows you the decoded signal to noise ratio. It shows you what it was the last time you decoded it. It shows the maximum SNR that you ever decoded, and it shows the minimum SNR you ever decoded. So you can get an idea of just how strong that station is and whether it's strong stable or whether it's uh, signal to noise ratio is changing. So here we see in the network column, Anything that was decoded by WSJTX says so. Here's some of the other spot sources. CQDX um, is, uh, the, is the uh, web summit. Here's some uh, 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 spot databases around, excuse me, some uh, telnet clusters around the world, K1TTT, uh, J1RJM, EI7, MRE. These are all DX clusters. Um, and you can see the last, the call sign of the last station to spot this active station. So many of these will have been spotted by many stations. We'll see that in a bit, but you can see who the most recent spotter was. And most of these that were WSJTX decoded it, I'm the most recent spotter, but not always. So because we're a mobile group, um, we want to keep track of what's going on in the world when we're not in our radio shacks. So you can see what's in the active DX database and filter it just like you can from your shack from any web browser on any computer. So here, this is, I think this is Chrome, and I'm just showing the same kind of view that we just looked at. And in fact, there's a small view that works on smartphones. So there are DX Lab users who, while they're out mowing their lawn on their sit down traffic or sit down mowers, are keeping an eye on what's going on on active stations that are needed. Um, and they'll stop their mowers and run in to work. So that was the um, tabular view. We also can generate audio and email. So <laughs> when a new active database entry is created for a needed DX station, you can get an audio announcement that tells the call sign, whether it's DXCC or, or uh, an IOTA tag, the band and mode, basically, you know, why is it needed? Or you can get an outgoing email message which can, which can initiate a text message. So these mechanisms make it pretty easy to be doing something else while you're DXing. Maybe you're doing some paperwork or maybe you're uh, you know, filling out a report 
but an audio announcement will instantly alert you if something you need becomes QRV, or maybe you want to do that with email and text. The next view I want to talk about is a world map view, where we basically take the information in this active DX database, and instead of putting it in a table as we just looked at, we plot it on a world map. Um, and so what we're seeing here is the spotting station, like this one here in the south of Argentina, this little block dot represents the location of the spotting station. The red dot is the DX station. So the arcs that we see here are basically propagation links, active propagation links between spotting stations and spotted stations. So we can see this right now. I think we're looking at this on all bands. Um, but we have the ability to independently filter what we're seeing on the map from what we saw on the table. So right now we're seeing all the bands, 160, 80, 40 through six, and we're seeing all the modes. If we change this panel to not show all the bands, but just show 160, then when we look at our world map, what we see is just what's going on on 160 right now. And we can do that with all the bands. In fact, to make it easy to see what's going on, I invented this feature called ScanDX. And hopefully I've got this configured right. When you click ScanDX, this is what happens. On 160 meters. On 80 meters. On 40 meters. On 30 meters. On 20 meters. On 17 meters. On 15 meters. On 12 meters on 10 meters, on six meters. So could you guys hear that audio? That's the voice of Joe DX. He's the same guy that, yes. that uh, voices announcements of needed DX station. So in one minute, by clicking scan DX, you get an instant understanding of actual propagation on each of the bands. And you can decide which of the bands you wanna do that for. You don't have to do all of them. So besides having its own built-in world map, uh, DX Lab will interoperate with DX Atlas. And so that's a nice zoomable, panable map. So here we are looking at an opening on six meters uh, in Europe. That's why I say these guys have it easiest. Look at that. Um, you work DXCC on six meters in an afternoon out there. Um, here's the same opening on Google Earth. Um, and here's zooming back out on Google Earth to look at a 12 meter opening. And you can, of course, as you can with Google Earth, you can spin the globe around and see the openings from all perspectives. So that's an example of some interoperation that, that DX Lab provides. Let's move to the next view, which is the band spread view. So here, what we see is my radio's frequency is 14080. I've got this configured to show a range of 10 kilohertz. So I'm seeing 10 kilohertz on either side of my transceiver frequency. All of the active stations are plotted here. I should have mentioned this when I showed the first view. When a station is known to QSL via logbook of the world, it has a yellow background. When it's known to QSL via EQSL, it has a pink background. And if it's known to QSL via both, it has a baby blue background. And that color scheme, you can change it if you want, but it's used everywhere. So it was present on the tabular view, we'll see it's present everywhere. And so when we're looking at this, we can, you know, as we tune around, other things appear on the band spread. You can double click one of these and it will immediately tune your radio to that frequency. And if you want, rotate your antenna to the short path or long path, path heading. So that's a nice, another nice way to cruise the bands. The next view is called the spectrum view. So recent ICOM radios, 705 all the way to 9700, have the ability to report spectrum data via the CAT interface. So we automatically manage this to basically provide you with a spectrum, just like the radio does and a waterfall just like the radio does, but we decorate this also with all of the active DX stations from the spot database. So again, you can see them all, they're color-coded to show need and they're color-coded to show participation in EQSL and LOTW. And there's some nice stuff here that actually goes further than what the radios do to be able to do zoom and uh, go you know, work in a particular subband, the CW subband or the phone subband. Uh, you can directly manipulate reference levels and gain from the front. Uh, so it won't go into all the details here. You do a similar thing if you're a flex radio user and you use smart SDR with your flex signature radio, then we can plot 
active DX stations on smart SDR with the same capabilities. Click one of these and it, QS, and it will QSY your radio. Um, same color encoding. Uh, if something was needed, like P5DX is needed here, you see it that's supposed to be red. Um, and the background colors to show EQSL and LOTW. Just recently, like a month ago, I released a new interoperation with Steve N2IC's waterfall band map. This is something he originally developed for N1MM, but N1MM and DX Lab use a lot of the same protocols. Uh, we're not twins, but we like each other. Um, so stuff that gets built for one can often work with the other. In this case, it was pretty easy to do this. The advantage of this spectrum waterfall is it runs with pretty much any soft, software defined radio, not just the icons as you saw in the previous screenshot. And you can configure it to work with either RF or IF input. So this is, an, I, I did this using a $200 um, uh, SDR play uh, widget. It's about two, two inches by three inches and it gives me a nice spectrum display and I'm seeing the spotted stations with the right color coding as always. The last view is probably the one that DX Lab users know least about. A lot of people who have seen this presentation who are longtime DX Lab users go on about, well, gee, I learned about a lot of stuff I didn't know about. And this view is one of the biggies. What this view does is it takes the information in the spot database and it plots it showing bands on the Y axis, on the vertical axis, and time of day on the horizontal axis. And at each cell, it's showing me that in this case, it's showing me that there were eight six meter, eight active stations on six meters at 12 Zulu on six meters. So I can see that six meters was pretty quiet here till about 12 Zulu. It peaked up with 12 active stations at 13 Zulu and then kind of slowly petered out. Here's what 10 meters did. Here's what 12 meters did. Here's what 15 meters did. Here's what 17 meters did, and et cetera. So you can see that you know the high bands peter out during the day, the low bands, excuse me, the, the low bands peter out during the day, the high bands peter out during the night. But you can get an idea of what is active at what time of day. And well, this is just the beginning of how we're going to use this mechanism as, as we show how this makes you more effective. And the last of the views, and probably the most recent view added, is this WSJTX view. So this is WSJTX, but I'm exploiting some interfaces that the WSJTX team put in there where I can color code all the call signs to show need um, and to show participation in LOTW or EQSL. And these, all these decoded stations are being routed into spot collector where they go into the spot database. So there's a very nice integration um, and this is a very useful view because you can say, oh my, VU3 on 40 meters, FT8, I really wanna go after that. One click and you're there. So that's what I mean by multiple views of active DX. And it, as I say, it is the fundamental unique capability that DX Lab provides that as far as I know, nothing else does. So how do we use that to find the DX we need and work it? So the, let's start with this. What is currently QRV that I need? Now this was done, this exercise was done, I think back in April and May, yeah. So I just said, show me everything I need. So the first thing you note is all, almost all of them are FT8. That's because I've got DX Lab configured saying, I wanna work every DXCC entity on FT8. So most of these are FT8. There's lots of interesting targets though. There's three whiskey, five whiskey, there's, here's an EP2, um, VR, XV, and some of these things are probably boring for you West Coast guys, but pretty interesting for us. Here's one that's interesting to all of us, ZC4, uh, the, so the sovereign bases on Cyprus. Not very often, and you know, here you can see a couple entries for that. But trying to make heads or tails out of all this, I mean, you know, it's just too much information. Um, so let's go a little bit deeper. Oh, I wanted, to, I wanted to show you something. The question is, why do I need ZC4GR? So I right click on that and it tells me that digital status is not worked and sought. And the reason that's the case is because of this thing I already showed you, which is I'm trying to work everything on FT8. Okay, so let's go see how we're doing on ZC4. We go to the real time tracking window, select the DXCC tab, 
scroll down to ZC4, and we can see that I've pretty much got a word credit everywhere, but I've never worked it on six, and I haven't worked it on FT8, and that's why it's showing up as needed. So if I now say, okay, well, FT8 is wonderful, but it's not really going to move my challenge progress or my DXCC honor roll progress. So let's turn off FT8 right now. Let's just uncheck it. And so we don't see all those FT8 DX stations. Now what we're left with, we look at this, is a much more tractable set of things I need that are currently QRV. Most all of them, in fact, all of them are either on 80 meters or 160. So let's look a little more closely. We see EZ1WS. Well, that's not valid for DXCC right now. VK1000AF is operating in sideband. Uh, you know, trying to do 80 meter sideband. I'm not up for that right now. And everything else was spotted after my sunrise, which was 1030Z. So even though there's a bunch of stuff that's active right now, it's not really stuff that I can do much with because it's all on 160 and 80 and, and my sun's up. Um, so let's go after ZC4GR as an exercise. What will, how would we use DX Labs capabilities to maximize our ability to get a QSO confirmed from ZC4GR? So the first thing I'm going to do is look at this QRZ page. So this is that Pathfinder component we, we looked at earlier. I've typed in ZC4GR, or I just clicked the spot, would put it there. I've clicked QRZ, and now I'm looking at his QRZ page, and what's it say? It says he's running an FT450. Okay, so this guy's got 100 watts and he's running a Wyndham antenna. And here's the bands he's QRV, 40 through 12. So that right away tells us something about uh, what, what kind of signal we're gonna expect from there, not a big one, especially if you're on the West Coast, um, and where to look on these bands. Now what I'm gonna do is say, show me all of ZC4GR's activity. So I'm going to type ZC4, which is the prefix, and I'm going to click DXCC. And now I'm filtering this display to show all active DX entries for ZC4GR. So we can gain some information from this. You know, if we look at this, here's one. He started at 1590, quit at 1538. Started at 1943, ended at 1943. Started at 1628, ended at 1628. 1741, 1825. 1914, 1915, 2031, same. 1420, 14. This guy doesn't hang around long. You know, he shows up on a frequency. He might spend five or 10 minutes there. You know, here's one where he spent almost an hour. Um, but if this guy gets spotted, we're going to have to get there quickly because it's rare for him to spend a lot of time on frequency. Now, here's one where he came on at 1229 and stayed till 2136. So that's an exception. But, um, we can just by looking at the times get a sense for his operating pattern, a little bit of a sense. We can see the bands he was operating on, no surprise there, same ones he said on his QRZ page. When we look at where he's spotted from, boy, the Europeans are having a field day. They're really feasting on this guy. Um, the guys in Asia are doing pretty good too. Africa, nobody. South America, a couple people. Um, East Coast of North America, only twice. And look at this, one of them was me because this is my WSJTX SNR. And I actually decoded this guy. Uh, notice that the ODX, the closest DX station, the distance is zero. That means it was my station. And he actually got up to a minus 11 at one point. We'll look at this in more detail. Somebody else must have worked him from the East Coast too, right here. And that person was 86 miles from my QTH. We can look at the propagation, uh, the probabilities. You know, VOA cap said I had a 96% chance of working this guy on this on the on the uh, on the short path had it been around in my with my butt in my chair, um, and here was 97%. Whereas most of the other you know, there were other times when he was also at least according to, to uh, uh, VOA cap workable. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say show me all the spots that were associated with this one entry when he started at 1229 and ended up at 2136. No, I'm not. I'm going to first show you this view. Um, this view shows when he was active by band and mode. So remember the propagation view? So we click the analyze button. Now we're seeing this information, but organized by time of day and band. So now we can see that he spent a very little time on 10 meters, showed up once on 12, but a little bit more active on 15 from roughly 11 Zulu to 18 Zulu never showed up on 17, quite active on 20, quite active on 30, and active on 40. You can see exactly when that was, from 14Z to about 20Z. 
So now we're going to home in on this situation where I actually decoded the guy and look at all the constituent spots. There were so many that I had to elide the ones that all came from Europe. So here's the first time he was spotted, 1229 by an S53, had a signal to noise ratio of minus three. So yeah, he was loud in Europe. And there are a bunch more Europeans all the way to SV2 CSR at 1637. Then suddenly at 1730, um, he gets decoded by somebody on the East Coast of North America saying CQ from, and that the, the guy who decoded him was in KM65, that's the grid square. So, um, so more and more and more, and then eventually I decode him. Um, and I start recording his signal to noise ratio. Um, and then here's the last time I decoded him all the way down here, I decoded him calling TA92L. So now what we're seeing here is somewhere in the order of 50 different spots of ZC4GR on this one time period on 20 meter uh, FT8 from 1230 to 122129. 20, and all the different stations that spotted and what the SNRs were when that happened. Here's that second opening. Um, and here we can see that that was the, the, the second time we were able to decode him on the East Coast, that was K1JX, uh, who's on the East Coast. And according to this, K1JX is about 86 miles from IQTH. So odds are, if I was listening, I'd have been able to decode that too. What was going on with the sun on those two times when we were able to decode ZC4GR on the East Coast? Well, on the 23rd, the solar flux index uh, started out around 84 and dropped down to around 76. Uh, on the 30th, it started out around 78, maybe dropped down to 72. What about the geomagnetic A index? You guys know this stuff, right? This is the amount of solar flux coming from the sun. This is what illuminates the ionosphere. Uh, the denser the ionosphere, the more reflections we get uh, and the better DX is. The geomagnetic A index is basically how active is the geomagnetic field. The more active it is, uh, the more problems we have because these geomag uh, geomagnetic storms absorb radio signals to the point where they can cause complete blackouts. On the 23rd and the 30th, it was pretty modest. The A index was around 16, around 10. So nothing unusual here. But this tells us something about what the propagation conditions were the two times that stations on the East Coast could decode ZC4GR. My next trick is to see, are there any gray line openings between my QTH and ZC4GR? And the answer is no. So in DX Lab, there's a gray line, uh, there's a gray line window. It's called the sunrise sunset window. Uh, it will give you the sunrise and sunset times for any location on the planet, or here I have it configured to show me gray line openings. So it's got the latitude and longitude of UK military bases on Cyprus. It knows my QTH, and it says, sorry, Dave, no gray line opening. So we can't do anything there. Here is PropView. PropView is a graphical user interface on top of VOACAP. VOACAP is a propagation prediction engine uh, that was developed by the United States government. It's a Fortran program. All of its output is numbers, uh, which are useful, but it's hard to see things. So PropView, which is a member of the suite, displays the same kind of frequencies and bands on the y-axis, time of day on the x-axis, and the thicker the line, the wider the opening, the, 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 more, the, the stronger the opening. So for example, here, we're seeing that the forecast on 20 meters at this time is 27 dB, and the probability that we'd be able to work on, on the short path, because that's what I asked for, short path propagation opening at minus 10 dB is 96%. That means not, not 90, on 96% of the days, um, we, would, we would have at least a minus 10 dB signal to noise ratio between my QTH and, and UK basis. Um, you can see the forecast for the other bands. You can see how the low bands go away uh, during the middle of the day. High bands work best you know, when, the, when, the, when the sun is shining. This display down here is very nice because it shows you whether you and the DX station are in sunlight or in darkness. So finding periods of common darkness, for example, to make QSOs on the low band, pretty easy. That's you know common darkness for ZC4GR is 0Z to 2Z. And you can also see when the gray line times are. And you can see that the gray line times never match up, which is why there's no gray line openings between my QTH and ZC4GR. We have seen that here as well. What's another way to assess propagation? Well, some clever guys in the Northern California DX Foundation set up a whole bunch of beacons all around the world. 
and these beacons continuously transmit. They transmit with stepped power levels. Uh, here's where they all are. Um, and they transmit on all the different bands, 20 meters, 17 meters. They don't do the low bands, but everything from 50, 10 meters down to 20 meters. So you can set up using this mechanism, a schedule where you can pick the beacons you wanna monitor and PropView will automatically set up a schedule. And if you want, if you click the QSY button, it will actually QSY your rig every 10 seconds to monitor the next beacon. Well, what's important here is 4X6TU is a beacon that's not very far from the UK military bases. So this is a technique we can use. If we can hear 4X, the 4X6TU beacon, we'll probably be able to hear ZC4GR. So this is another way to look at actual propagation. So now we're starting to think about how we're going to work this guy. So maybe I'm going to ask the question, who near me has been spotting stations near ZC4? So this gives me a broader view of propagation. It's not just limited to ZC4, it's everybody around ZC4. And it's not just my QTH, it's everybody near me. So I'm going to define a filter, a custom filter, that's near ZC4. And what I'm going to say is, any of these countries, ZC4, Cyprus itself, Turkey, Lebanon, Israel, Egypt, spotted by stations within 500 miles of my QTH. So the expression for that is DXCC prefix, and here's the list of the prefixes I care about. It's the same list here. And that ODX column has to be less than 500. So this is going to show me whenever somebody was in this, was copying these guys from near my QTH. And here's what the tabular view looks like. So now this is getting pretty interesting because we see ZC4GR, we see a lot of Turkish stations, we see when it's happening, but there's a lot of data here. Again, the clutter overwhelms us. So what do we do? We look at the propagation view. Now we can really see what's going on. So we can see in the bands versus time view that the biggest opening to that area of the world is around on 20 meters between 14 and especially getting around 1920 Zulu to around 22 Zulu. There's some openings on 30 meters, there's some openings on 40 meters, but this is really when the band is open between my QTH and the ZC4 area is this time right here between 20 Zulu and 22 Zulu. And we can correlate that with what we saw earlier, uh, which is when he's active. I'll show you that in a minute. We can also compare the forecast propagation with the actual propagation. And you can see it pretty much correlates. As usual, propagation prediction is a little bit optimistic. So it's predicting openings here that we're not actually seeing for real. Uh, maybe, nobody, maybe everybody's asleep during this time in that area of the world, but there is pretty good correlation with this part of the propagation prediction with the actual propagation we see with this analysis. So now we can put a plan together. We're going to monitor the 20 meter FT8 subband from 12 Zulu to 23 Zulu, especially, and I can't see it because this, this block is in my way, but especially the, the times when he's QRV, um, which on 20 meters is 12 to 23 Zulu. We're going to be, be especially attentive when the solar flux is 75 or above and when the NCDX 4X beacon in Israel is being copied. So if we can copy the beacon, if the solar flux is up around 75, then we really want to be looking around the FT8 subband in this time period, particularly 22 Zulu to 23 Zulu in that area. There's another trick we're going to make, and that is we're going to use a European DX cluster as a spot source. Why are we going to do that? So that means one of these spot sources is going to be a, a European cluster. Eventually, every cluster sends all its data to every other cluster. But I have noticed over the past 20 years I've been doing this, that the closer a cluster is to a DX station, the more rapidly it gets reported. So European clusters will report ZC4GR being spotted more rapidly than North American clusters, sometimes by as much as 60 seconds or 120 seconds. Now, remember, we said that ZC4 doesn't hang along, ZC4GR doesn't hang around very long. So if he gets spotted, you know, A, he's not going to be, be there very long, and B, there's going to be cluster hordes descending on, on, on his frequency. So a 60-second or 120-second lead by using a European cluster might be the difference between making the QSO and not making the QSO. 
We're also going to put ourselves in a position to rapidly QSY if ZC4 is GR is spotted on some band other than the 20 meter band that we're monitoring. So there's two ways to do that. One is to enable audio announcements, which you heard an example of, so that when he's spotted, uh, we don't have to have our eyes glued on the spot table. It will be announced. And we're also going to exploit something that Commander does. That's the transceiver control mechanism, which is it allows you to specify all of the settings for your amplifier, for your tuner, by frequency. So I, this, I did this when I had an AL1200. I'm currently using a no-tune amplifier. But my AL1200 amplifier had a plate setting, a load setting, and a band setting. And so for each frequency, I can say what the right settings are. And then whenever I QRB to a, a QSY to a particular frequency, the settings for my amplifier and the settings for my tuner appear right here in the main window. So I don't have to go looking around for the scraps of paper in which I wrote all this stuff on. It's just always right there. I never lose it. And it's always correct. So that lets me QSY with a non-automatic amplifier really quickly. You could actually go further because this has a programmatic interface. If you wanted to build you know, the right uh, uh, mechanisms to twirl the, automatically twirl the knobs on your amplifier, you could do that. So that's our plan. Um, let's see. There's another set of things I wanted to talk about. We talked a little bit about FT8. Um, and you know, people are, some people like FT8, people don't like it. Everything we've talked about so far, we would do whether ZC4GR was working CW, RIDI, or sideband, or FT8. All those techniques are apply equally to all of those modes. However, there's some things we would do in addition if we were dealing with ZC4 working CW, or RIDI, or sideband. So, and that's because this first one, this notion of blue planet printing the bland with local spots, FT8 is panoramic. It decodes the entire band, shows you all the stations active on the band. That doesn't happen unless you're using CW skimmer or something like that. So what we'd like to be able to do is, oops, insert information directly into the spot database without sending it out to the cluster. So it's called a local spot. So as I'm cruising around the band looking for something, you know, looking for the DX I'm looking for, and I come across a, a, a station in sideband, I wait for him to identify it's SV3AQR. Okay, well, that's not the ZC4 I'm looking for, even though he has a pretty good accent. So I do a local spot of that. So now that appears in my band spread and every place else within the angle brackets. That says local spot. And what it means is when I'm tuning around, if I come across the signal again, I won't have to wait for him to identify to say, who is that again? I've already said that's SV3AQR. So you build up a blueprint of what's on the band by locally spotting stations as you hear them. This is actually something that um, uh, a technique that came out of a, a really good book, uh, the, DX, the, the DXers Guide, Bob Loker, K7, and K, K9, YNI. I forget the name of the book, but he's really big on patrolling the band and keeping track of what you hear. And so this is an automated mechanism for doing that. So if zc 4 GR is spotted, we're going to quickly double click, uh, which will QSY and he's working split uh, in CW would set us to that frequency. And if we are using dual frequencies or a pan adapter, we'll use that to rapidly locate his listening frequency. So what do I mean by that? So the rig control component, Commander, can control up to four different transceivers, not simultaneously, one at a time. One of these is your primary transceiver. But it also has a notion of a secondary radio. You can use a secondary radio as a secondary receiver so that if you don't have a radio that will operate split well or won't let you, doesn't have dual receive, doesn't have a dual receiver, you can use a second radio and be able to look around in the split zone to find out where the last workstation was so you can more rapidly find the right frequency on which to call next for a station working split. So these are techniques that, that you can use for CW, sideband, and RIDI. You can also do the same thing with a pan adapter um, and find, again, the split, you know, find the station where the DX station last work split. So um, we have gone through the entire architecture of the suite. We've talked about finding and working the decks you need. Um, there's documentation for all of this, a lot of it, uh, in HTML, PDF. 
There's task-oriented documentation and reference documentation. There's a web page where you get it all, www.dxlabsuite.com. It's completely free. There's no advertising. Um, and that's the DX Lab Suite. Comments or questions? You're muted, Thank Richard. Thanks for what you're doing. That's very good, David. I, this is a tremendous amount of work you did. Well, I've been, working, I've been working on this for 30 years. I started in 1990 when I got my license. For the first 10 years, it was just for me. And people, people convinced me and helped me with this idea of, of creating a product. And that's when I split it all up and went public. So it's been publicly in use for about 20 years and continuously improved. A lot of, the, a lot of what you saw comes from those people in the DX Lab online group, the four or 5,000 of them who have contributed to this. Dave, a uh, comment, uh, Bob W6OPO, um, about each application, knowing the other one's there. I found that there is a sequence between Commander and DX Keeper. Uh, DX Keeper won't know Commander's there if DX Keeper started first. I didn't use Launcher, okay? I just started DX Keeper but it doesn't get the frequency information from Commander, which I started after Keeper was up. But if it's the other way around, uh, Commander's up, Keeper will get that data. Are you so aware of that? If that? No, I'm not aware of that. And if that's true, it's a defect. Um, so do me a favor and send me an email message or post something on the reflector and I'll get on it. Will do. Uh, Dave, uh, I've been using DX uh, Lab and uh, you were correct. I, I never knew about propagation view uh, at, at all. So uh, I did learn something. I learned a bunch of stuff tonight, but that was one of them. Well, the propagation view is very helpful in taking a whole lot of information and boiling it down into a form that makes it really useful. Uh, Dave? Yeah. Yeah, I imagine if anybody else has any further questions, I can get get a hold of you through, uh, via your qrz.com. Yeah, aa6yq at ambersoft.com. Ambersoft.com. Yep. But Dave, I can't thank you enough. It was a wonderful program, and I appreciate you spending some time with us this evening. Uh, we'll look forward to your next presentation sometime very soon. Yeah, I'll develop. I'll spend the next thirty years developing another software. Speaker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I'll see, you guys, I'll see you guys then. All right. Well, great. Thank, great you. Presentation. thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah. My pleasure. You know, uh, My Bob pleasure. LPO again. I used to be on another logging program years ago. Thanks, Dave. A good friend said W6JJW took me, took me kicking and screaming and uh, screaming into this uh, more digital world in Dex Lab and wow, <laughs> I've been on it now about I don't know 15 20 years. <laughs>